So, um, when uh, Gisal invited me to uh, present this uh, webinar, it was back in March. So, uh, we, we, we were starting to have the, um, the quarantine, right? And I thought that by now, by the end of May, uh, the quarantine would be over and students would be back in the classroom. But unfortunately, this is not the case, right? So uh, even though my, uh, my webinar is about speaking, uh, most of the things or the, the ideas and the suggestion I will talk about uh, in, during this webinar, you can also um, use them for uh, online teaching, right? For teaching remotely, okay? So I will give you also some ideas on how you can apply uh, these ideas to remote teaching, all right? Uh, we are going to use the, the, the chat a lot. I like my uh, webinars to be interactive, okay? So uh, please use the chat to answer the questions, all right? Okay, shall we start? I see we have lots of people online. Okay, so I'd like to start off with a little quiz. It's a short quiz. And I'd like you to answer using the chat, right? Okay, so let's start. So the first question is, for teachers, is the most important skill in class? A, B, or C? What do you think? B, 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 ah, yes, thank you. Speaking, yes, good. Yes, B is the correct answer, right? Okay, so, uh, and this, uh, it's interesting because Cambridge, uh, we have this uh, notion of what's important and what the students consider to be difficult, to be important, but it's all, always good to have uh, surveys and research behind it, behind it to make sure that we have the right assumptions, right? So we knew before this, um, this, this uh, research, before this survey, that teachers consider this important, but the, the research confirmed it, okay? Second question, for students, it's the most difficult skill in English. Which one do you think? B again. Yes, yeah, some people said listening, no, but the correct answer is B again. Speaking is the most difficult according to, to research, right? Of, not for everybody, of course, right? For some, for most students, okay? For some students, writing is more difficult. For the others, listening is more difficult. So, of course, it varies. But for most students, speaking is the most difficult. One more. Many students measure their progress in English through their confidence and ability to, oh, I've answered it already. Oh, sorry. <laughs> B, yes, the answer is there already. Okay, they've made a mistake here. Number four. The, this one is a little bit more difficult, a little bit more challenging. The top three speaking activities in class are A, B, or C. What do you think? Many people answering A, some people answering C. Uh, there is no... No... Uh, Let's see the correct answer. The correct answer is C, role plays, discussions, and presentations. Okay? Debates are not very common. Bruno got it right. Yes, many people got it right. Thank you. Okay. And the last one. The most common reasons for students not to speak are a, B, or C? What do you think? Mm, 
Most people are answering A, some people answering B, some people C. Yes, definitely here. Yes, the correct answer is A, shyness and fear of embarrassment. Okay, so many students are shy, many students feel embarrassed to speak. Okay. Uh, so, as I, I said, uh, Cambridge uh, conducted a survey with teachers and students all over the world. And one of the questions they asked was, what do you find most difficult in English? And the answer is speaking. By far is the most difficult skill in English for students. And then we have vocabulary, grammar, writing, listening, politeness rules, reading, translation, etc., etc. So you can see uh, speaking is considered very difficult for students. You agree? Thank you, Genilda. Yes, Sergio, real conversation is very difficult, right? Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. So one of my colleagues uh, said that many students measure their progress in English through their confidence and ability to speak spontaneously when faced with situations in the real world, such as helping a, student, a tourist with directions in the street or greeting a colleague from overseas at work. If the student struggles, they feel that they have made no progress in English despite, despite studying for many years. And we see that in many students, right? I, I have uh, interviewed students for, for schools for many years. And uh, when we were uh, assessing them, and especially when we, we were uh, placing them in the correct level, right? And I felt sometimes there was a huge gap between their ability to read and write and their ability to uh, speak. And uh, let me, forgot to mute my phone, sorry. Let me mute it, just a second. Okay, sorry about that. And uh, so I remember once I, I interviewed a student and uh, I checked his writing, uh, his reading and writing uh, test. And he was really a C1 in reading and writing, but he was like a B1 in uh, speaking. So there was a, this huge gap, right? So we see that a lot. Do you agree? Yes, there are students who, who, who have studied for many years. They can read, they can write very well, but when it comes to speak, it's difficult for them. They can't, right? Or they struggle. Lack, lack of speaking ability, sure. Okay, so for many students, how I feel about speaking equals how I feel about my language ability. Okay, so if they think they can speak well, that's the, their uh, language ability. Right, this is also a trap. Yes, thank you, Thiago. Yes, uh, uh, we call this trap the speaking paradox. Why is it a speaking paradox? Because even though they know it's difficult, they know it's important, right? They know they, they, they need to speak, they don't. They don't practice enough. They, they, they think um, they, they uh, are reluctant to practice it, right? And, uh, and teachers is the same. It's also speaking, teachers know it's very important, but sometimes we don't devote enough time to it, right? Uh, we should devote more time to uh, speaking, okay? As so what happens is sometimes the speaking practice is squeezed into the other parts of the syllables like vocabulary, grammar, right? Um, or uh, expressions or things like that, 
right? So sometimes we leave the speaking practice to the end of the unit because we have a lot of things to cover and then we don't have enough time to practice speaking or we do it in a rush, right? Yes, thank you. You agree, Solange? Yes. Thank you, Thiago. So, as we said before, sometimes students are afraid to speak or are reluctant to speak, right? So, what are the typical blockers for participation in speaking practice? Shyness, please use the, the, the chat, please, to answer that. Can you answer it, please? What do you think? Shyness, fear, thank you, Ana, Ana Paula. Shyness, fear, shyness, fear of mistakes, lack of confidence, yes, perfectionism, nervousism, lack of confidence, lack of vocabulary also, lack of vocabulary, okay, scared of making mistakes, fear of mistake, uh-huh, that's right, thank you very much. Let me see, I have just a few here, uh, you most of them, you've, you've mentioned them already, right? Fear of judgment from peers and our, the teacher. Uh, lack of confidence, uh, embarrassment, uh, and inability to formulate ideas in English on the spot, right? And uh, fear of mistakes, yes, not enough time to think, that's right. Yes, uh, if you think of it, if you ask a student to uh, answer a question in writing, it's much easier because they have time to think, right? If you ask them, interferes on the mother tongue, yeah. If you ask them a question, uh, uh, if you ask them to answer a question in speaking, they don't have much time to think, right? They have to, to answer it on the spot and they have to worry not only about the answer, but the language. So they have to worry about two things at the same time. Whereas if they are writing something, they can think about the answer and they can think about the language separately. So it's easier, right? Okay, let me tell you a little story. Um, I remember when I was uh, an exchange student in uh, New Zealand about uh, 30, 35 years ago, and uh, my English was bad. I, 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 well, I was probably uh, A2 at that time or A1, right? And I remember once I was with a group of people. Uh, I don't remember where exactly, I think at school. And somebody asked me what kind of school I studied in Brazil. And I said that I studied in a school of nurses. And everybody looked at me and they, they, they seemed intrigued by the answer, right? And I, I noticed that they, 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 they didn't understand my answer. So I said, uh, religious, religion. And then they all started laughing at me. And then I got very embarrassed because I didn't know why they were laughing at me, right? And then um, after some time, one of the guys there in the, the group came to me and said, no, it's not nurses, it's nuns. I said, oh, okay, thank you for correcting me, right? But I felt really embarrassed by this situation. I suppose we all have had similar situations because um, I suppose most of us in this uh, webinar have learned another language. Even if you are a native speaker, you've probably learned Portuguese or another language. And uh, you, you also felt um, one of those things, right? So I'd like you to ask me, try to remember a situation when you were studying a language and um, it's a st strange situation like mine and how you felt. So think of the situation and write down in the chat how you felt. I'll give you 30 seconds to think of a situation. 
I had a similar situation, yeah. Embarrassed. Thank you, Beatriz. Yes, we feel embarrassed sometimes, right? Felt terrible, bad. Mm -hmm. I felt as if we were from another planet, right? Sad. Okay. I mispronounced guinea pig. Okay. I felt angry, terrible, scared. I learned from my mistake. Yes, you can learn from your mistake. It's true. I will never forget this word again because it. Uh, you don't want to feel embarrassed again, right? Once you feel scared and embarrassed, you don't want to feel it again. It's not a good feeling. Do you agree? I start to hate the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. If the teacher made you feel embarrassed, if the teacher made you feel uh, bad, you start to hate the teacher. You felt stupid. Okay. Great. It's better to attach, you attach positive feelings, of course, of course, but sometimes you don't, right? So you should avoid that. Felt stupid. Okay. Thank you. This is a, a quote from a student. Honestly, I get nervous sometimes, right? And I suppose it happens to all students. Okay, get me out of this place, Lucas, Lucas said. Uh-huh. So what can we do to help students overcome this anxiety? Well, according to Dorney, I don't know how to, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Uh, research tells us that students learn better in contexts where they feel confident, motivated, supported, and able to experiment with language, right? So, and how do you get this context? Well, uh, in order to give students the best chance of success in developing their speaking, we need to create a safe speaking environment, right? And this is true not only for our profession. Think, for example, about psychologists. Uh, if you go to the psychologist, I've never been to a psychologist, but I know this happens. Uh, if you go to a psychologist office, uh, are you going to tell about all of your problems on the first day? I don't think so, right? It's take, it takes time for the, the, for the psychologist and the, the patient right, to create this safe environment. Not in this case, not in speaking, but a safe environment, right? So it takes some time, okay? And the same thing applies to uh, the learning uh, the, 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 in the classroom, right? In order to create a safe speaking environment, it takes some time. Of course, there will be students who will be speaking a lot on the first class, but that's not the case for most students, right? And, and, uh, as there are uh, people who talk about their personal problems to anybody, right? Somebody they meet on the street, but that's not the most common, right? So what do you think this is? Any ideas? Uh, somebody wrote something that I couldn't read, sorry. Cake, yes, thank you, it's a cake. So it, as you can see, this cake has five layers, right? And uh, these layers will, will represent the five elements that you need to combine to create a safe speaking environment, okay? Yes, it's a cake, <laughs> all right? So let's look at these five elements. So the first element would be time. Students need time to practice speaking, right? And sometimes, or most of the time, we don't give them enough time. So, uh, because um, we cannot expect our students to practice speaking outside of the classroom. It would be wonderful if they did, but most of them don't. They practice some uh, listening by listening to music. Sometimes they practice some um, reading because they see things written in English outside of the classroom, but very few of them will practice speaking. So uh, 
yes, we can tell them to practice outside, but the truth is most of them won't, right? Uh, so we need to give them as much practice uh, in class as possible, right? And uh, let's go to the next slide. So how much of your lessons should be devoted to speaking? What do you think? Tell me a percentage, in terms of percentage. How much of your lessons should be devoted to speaking? 70, 80, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> no, not so much, not so much. As much as possible, yes. Well, according to 60, oh. Well, according to Nation and Newton, you should have at least 25%, at least, but as much as possible, as Lucia and Eva said, right? Uh, you should include speaking uh, throughout the lesson, right? 25 is not enough. Well, if you have a dedicated speaking activity that takes, if you have a, a one hour class and you have um, 15 minutes for this dedicated for only for speaking, that's okay, it's not bad, right? Yes, speaking is not only speaking, as somebody said, right? Uh, if you are, if you're a student, if you're teaching vocabulary, you they are speaking. You ask them to repeat the vocabulary, right? If you're teaching grammar, they are speaking. So they have to speak a lot in class. But the problem is, So, so you, should, you, should, you should have a balance between language-focused work and speaking practice, right? And this balance is very important. If we go back to the old uh, PPP, right, which is sometimes criticized, but still I find it very useful, uh, we have, in a class, we should have presentation, practice, and production. And where does the fluency take place where the students measure their success? And it's very important. Fluency takes place in production. So sometimes we forget about that, or we don't forget, but we concentrate, spend too much time on practice and presentation. And don't, doesn't, we, do not, we do not allocate enough time for production. Of course, students need a lot of practice. They need presentation, a good presentation. But we should always, always uh, focus on production. We should spend more time on production. All right? On fluency. And the production stage is where the language is used in a more open way. Things like role plays, communication tasks, collaborative tasks, discussion activities. So Elizabeth said we should try to anticipate production stage and we should prepare our students for the production stage, right? So the focus of this stage is using the language as fluently and naturally as possible, as the students would do outside of the classroom. Do you agree? Okay. So when we think about these uh, kind of activities, right, like role plays, discussions, etc., some activities can be more accuracy oriented, and some can be more fluency oriented. If we're if you are practicing, for example, a grammar topic, you want accuracy, right? You want your students to be able to answer the questions correctly. But if you are focusing on fluency, this is not so important. You want them to speak more freely, right? But in order for them to speak more fluently, you need to give them time. So if it's accuracy you want, you can provide a short list of useful phrases. You can give them time to review or look up vocabulary. You can encourage your students to mentally rehearse. Right? As you go up the, 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 the arrow, 
you want more fluency, you, you, you should give your students time to research about the topic, time to brainstorm ideas with classmates, time to make notes about what they will say, time to think silently about the task. So you want again to give time to prepare. Otherwise, they, will, they might feel frustrated. For example, if you come to a student and say, what time did you have breakfast this morning? Okay, you want what? Accuracy. And they will answer, oh, I had breakfast at seven o'clock, or perhaps they will make a mistake and you will correct them. If you ask your students, what did you do on your last vacation? Then you need to give them time to think. They did a lot of things, right? If you ask this question to your student without giving them time to think, chances are they will get stuck. Or they will just say one thing. And you want them to speak more, right? So before giving uh, fluency activities to your students, give them time first. Okay? Time to think, time to make notes, time to brainstorm. If they are, yes, Jonathan said, if they have more time to prepare, they're going to be more accurate. Sure, they're going to be more accurate, but, uh, but if that's not the intention, then the intention is fluency. So if, even if they make mistakes, you're not going to correct it. Whereas if you are, if you want your students to be accurate, you are going to correct them. Okay? Yes, Roger, you said it all. Plan all steps. So we, we need to plan our activities. Okay. So during these activities, uh, teachers should be should act more as facilitators and managers instead of as, as an instructor, as an explainer right during this fluency activities so uh, the teacher should make sure that everybody knows what they should be doing provide help and encouragement to groups and individuals check that everybody is on task monitor the language that the students are producing okay so we should always walk around the classroom right to make sure that everybody is participating if you are teaching online now, uh, you can um, uh, have all your students in a group, right? Or you can have this uh, breakout rooms, like in Google Meet, you have the breakout rooms, and you can put two students in one room, two students in, in a, the other room, and you can walk into each room, okay? So it's very interesting. And then you can, like in a classroom, right? You, you, you walk into a room and then you walk into the other room and you can check oh, some, some, somebody is, is already doing that, right? So if you haven't done that yet, I recommend you do it. Yes, Zoom has it too. Okay, yes, I know Google Meet does, but Zoom also does. Okay, right? Uh, can you explain better? Yes, sure. Uh, it's a tool that you have in these programs like Zoom, and uh, Google Meet, where you create these rooms, special rooms called breakout rooms, and then you put your students in the rooms, right? So they are separated from each other. So you put two students in one room, five students in the other, and then you have all these students in different rooms, and you can walk into these rooms. You can enter the rooms and see what they are doing. Uh, WhatsApp has now, WhatsApp now gives this to now. Yes, excellent, excellent. Works perfectly, yeah. It's a good tool. It's a very interesting tool. Okay. Um, one thing that I, I, I don't like very much is, uh, uh, I think it's important to, not that I don't like, I think it's important to have group work, but I prefer pair work, right? I think that when you have a dominant student in a group, the, the a quieter student or the shy student does not produce enough, does not speak enough. 
when you have pair work, uh, the shy student will get more chance to speak. Right? Yeah, so pair work, I think, is better for students, for the shy students to speak. Especially if you have a large group. If you have a group of uh, six students, eight students, the shy students are not going to speak whatsoever. Only the, the, the more uh, extrovert student or the more the dominant student or the, the, the stronger students. Okay. The second element of the cake or the safe speaking environment are the topics. And the topics are very important. Why are they important? Why, what do you think? Please write on the, the chat box. What do you th why do you think the topics are important? I'll give you some time to engage students. It holds their attention to offer some guidance. Uh -huh. May interest the students to guide them, stimulate the ideas, in closer to the real world, call their attention, motivate. Yes, interesting and appropriate to the age. The age is important, right? Uh huh. Help to develop, put them, motivate them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very good. Thank you. So the topics must must be engaging and relevant. Why is that? Because of motivation. We want our students to be motivated, right? If the topics are not engaging and are not relevant to our students, chances are they are not going to be motivated and they are not going to speak, okay? Or they're going to speak very little. And we don't want that. We, do, we want our students engaged and motivated. So according to Meltzer and Hammond, Engagement with speaking activities is more likely when materials connect to the learner's experiences and background knowledge. Okay, so it's important to have topics which connect to the students, right? If you're teaching teenagers, some topics will interest them. If you're teaching adults, other topics will uh, uh, be interesting to them. Okay. Like we can put children talk about driving, yes, but we can talk about games. That's right. So the topics should be appropriate to the students, right? So that's why it's important to get to know your students. This is an example of a syllabus of a material called Eyes Open. Right. So from the syllables, you already you can have a, a, um, an idea of the topics that the material, the course book you're using is going to, to address. Right. In this case here, the topics are people, it's your life, school days, food, animal world, city life, sport. OK. And this material is meant for uh, preteens between the ages of 11 and 14. Right? So you can see here that the topics are things that are relatable to students at this age. Okay, So I, uh, if you are going to analyze the material for your students, I always recommend having a look at the topics in the syllabus to see if they are appropriate, if they are interesting for your students. Right? Of course, we will never please everybody. Yes, you can never please. Some students will find a topic very interesting, others will find it boring. But if we can have the majority of the class find the topic interesting, then that's what we can do, right? Somebody asked me to improve speaking for kids. Well, I, I must confess, kids are not my cup of cake. <laughs> I've never taught kids before, so... Uh, I usually have taught only teens and, and adults, so, but we have people who can help you with that. Uh, other things that you can use in your classroom, if you think that the material, some of the topics in your course book are not so interesting, you can add or you can insert current issues, right? And um, 
and uh, I think current issues are really interesting because students can usually relate to them. Right? So, for example, right now, a current issue is the, the coronavirus, right? Uh, in the UK, my colleagues in the UK, they say the C19. Okay, so I looked for a commercial about the, the coronavirus, and I found this interesting commercial. So I'm going to play it to you. Pay attention, please. It's a Uber commercial. like it beautiful right so uh, what kind of things can you use with your students um, if you play this uh, commercial what kind of topics can you exploit with your students well there are many things you can do with it right one thing for example you can um, exploit the verb tenses right and the, the verb tenses and the actions right so you can exploit feelings yes and uh, so you can ask your students for example you can form groups of students or or not let's work in pairs for example let me give you an idea so you form pairs right and you ask them to write down as many uh, activities as they can see on the video right so of course you have uh, if they don't know some of the of the verbs you can prepare that beforehand Right. So each student writes down the activities they see on the videos, and then um, uh, they they compare their activities, and they add the activities together. Right? If they 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 wrote the same activity, it's just one. Right? So they have to add their activities, and the groups with or the the pairs with uh, uh, the higher uh, incorrect answers can get a prize, for example, chocolate. So you gamify it a little bit, right? Or you can um, ask them, uh, uh, you can personalize th this commercial, okay? You can ask your students, what activities are they doing now? Are they doing now at home? What activities they did last year and they can't do now? Or if they are on quarantine, not everybody's on quarantine, quarantine, but some uh, most people I think are on quarantine now. Uh, so you can ask them, uh, for example, what are they uh, what are they going to, to do when the quarantine is over? Of course, it requires a lot of planning, yes. But you can you can use this, as I said, you can use these current issues to get your students to speak more freely. That's the idea. All right? Oops, where is my presentation here? Okay. The third, the third uh, element of the the safe speaking environment is immersion, right? Uh, and when we talk about immersion, we are talking about immersive speaking tasks or speaking activities, okay? 
And what do we mean by immersion? Uh, so immersive speaking activities are activities in which every student contributes to the final result. Right? So they are all immersed in it and they, everybody uh, contributes. And this kind of activity can improve learner engagement and confidence. And it can also relieve some of the anxiety around speaking because producing the language is not an end in itself, but rather the tool used to achieve the collaborative goal. An example of this is the, the, the video I just showed you. If I ask my students to pay attention to the activities they were doing, they are not going to worry about language or vocabulary. They are going to worry about the goal of the activity, which is to pay attention to the activities. Right? Uh, somebody's asking if we're going to receive these slides. Uh, Giselle is recording it and they are going to put it on the, the on their uh, Facebook page. Okay? So you can review these slides again, the Facebook page. All right? Okay, so, uh, so these immersive speaking activities are very important, right? where your students do not worry about language. They worry about the results, and the language is a tool, okay? That's pretty much the concept of CLIL, right? In CLIL lessons, the, the language is a tool, okay? Some kinds of, uh, some kinds of, uh, uh, immersive uh, speaking tasks are collaborative tasks, information gathering activity, who, why, how, what, where. For example, if I ask students, uh, what do you need to make a cake? So they look for this information, right? So it's information gathering. It's good to practice vocabulary. Information gathering is very good to learn new vocabulary. Yeah, you love Cleo, big fan of Cleo. I like it too. Problem solving, right? You give them a problem and they have to come up with the solution. Decision making, students have to decide which way to go, what to do, right? Very interesting kind of collaborative task and create something, right? ask your students to use their creativity. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, gave a, presented a, a webinar about uh, collaboration, right? which is a very important um, uh, life competence. So if you are interested in learning more about collaboration and collaborative tasks, you should look for this uh, webinar. I think it's recorded in the Giselle's uh, uh, Facebook page, okay? So learning from collaboration, language as a means to an end, not the end itself, right? So you use the language to answer the questions, but you're not really want your students to pay attention to the language. Join people, yes. Here's an example from a book called Evolve, where you have a collaborative task. Right? You have some pictures there, and you can see. Prepare, look at the pictures. Can you do these things in your country? When can you do them? Think about seasons, days, and times of day. Research, work with a partner. Choose a season or a month. Think of fun things to do in your city at that season time during the day, at night, and outside. Write a list. See, agree. Plan a fun weekend, 48 hours in your city. Choose activities from exercise B. Make plans for Saturday and Sunday. Discuss. Work with another pair and compare your plans. Ask and answer questions about their plan. Present. 
work with partner, present your 48 hour plan to the class. Which plan do you want to do? Right? Uh, somebody has to leave, Elizabeth has to leave. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Right, so this is an example of an immersive activity, right? Um, I suppose most course books nowadays have this kind of activities. If the course book you use doesn't have it, you should try to include it, okay? Or if you think there are not enough immersive activities, you should try to include more immersive activities in your class, right? Okay. Fourth, fourth uh, element is the peer interaction. You want, you, you want your students to have a positive peer interaction. You want them helping each other, not making fun of each other or uh, uh, making the uh, others feel embarrassed or feel afraid of something or making mistakes. And positive peer interaction, according to Adams, positive peer interaction happen when students are prepared for interaction focus on engaging activity grouped effectively and supported during their interaction. Integrating peer interaction into classroom teaching requires teacher to reflect carefully on their own teaching, considering how to adjust their strategy for peer interaction and how to use teacher-centered instru instruction to complete learning from peer learning. Right, so it's important to prepare it and to uh, support it. one-to-one -one classes uh, in one-to-one -one classes you don't have peers right so uh, you need to support your students right you pretend for if you're doing a role play you pretend you are the other student, right and in many situations you can pretend you are another student okay so the the your classroom should be a no judgment zone. Students should not judge each other. This is easier said than done, right? I know especially with teenagers, they feel judged all the time, right? So they are afraid of exposing themselves. So it's very hard to get students to overcome this barrier, right? So, uh, especially if we're, if we're talking about pair work, we, uh, according to Storch, uh, there are four kinds of interaction, peer interaction. So you can have a, a collaborative peer interaction, dominant peer interaction, dominant dominant, dominant passive and expert novice, right? Uh, in the collab collaborative peer interaction, both students listen and speak and they both learn from each other that's what you want right in a dominant dominant uh, peer interaction both students speak but they don't listen to each other so they don't really learn a lot in a dominant passive one student speaks the other listen so there is no feedback so the, the dominant doesn't learn much and the passive doesn't uh, uh, learn much either. And the last one, exp expert novice, uh, is not the ideal pair interaction, but it's uh, still uh, the, the novice, of course, is going to learn more from the expert, but still the expert can learn from the novice. How do I correct that one student makes fun of the other without creating a bad environment? Yes, uh, well, I usually, in the beginning of, the, of the, the year, right, of the term, I usually tell my students uh, things that uh, are not uh, allowed in the class. The teacher should always be a model for students, right? Um, if you uh, respect your students, if you don't make fun of your students, and you tell your students that they should not do something they don't want others to do, uh, at them, uh, then you can get them. And uh, of course, if uh, one student uh, insists on judging the others or making fun of others, you should call his attention, his or, his or her attention, 
right? You should not tolerate this kind of behavior. Okay. Uh, multi-level classes. Well, this is <laughs> another webinar. Okay, somebody asked me about the, the multi-level classes or the uh, mixed ability classes, right? But this is another webinar, <laughs> right? And uh, and the last uh, element of the safe speaking environment is the feedback. Feedback is very important. Uh, and of course, you should give a supportive feedback. If students are reluctant to speak because they are afraid of looking or sounding silly, of making mistakes and of being judged, we can make feedback less about error correction and more about support and encouragement. Right? So we should um, try not to, um, well, sometimes we need to correct uh, students' error, right? And it's interesting because if you uh, get to know your students and if you uh, create this nice relationship with them, sometimes with one gesture or with one uh, facial expression, you can um, tell your students they are making a mistake, right? So, for example, I remember... Um, I, um, most of the times I like it to uh, to make the 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 the, the mime like uh, the three dots, right? So, for example, uh, if my student said, um, "I I didn't went to the beach yesterday," and I said, "I didn't." And they say, oh, go, go to the beach, right? So sometimes you don't need to uh, correct the students all the time because sometimes with little gestures, with little things, you can get your students to correct themselves. Yes, that's right. You make them correct themselves, right? Now, of course, it's when you do it, when to do it. If you are in an activity that requires accuracy, then you need to correct your student at when they are speaking, right? If it's a, a freer activity, like if you are in a discussion, you are in a role play, uh, you should not correct your students. You, you can, perhaps you can take notes and after the activity finish, finishes, you go back to it and then uh, write on the board. You don't uh, identify which student made the mistake. No, you can write it on the board or or you can practice it, right, with all the students. Yes, it's not a good idea. Thank you, Eva. It's not a good idea to correct them during a conversation. Uh -huh. Then make a general correction so they won't feel embarrassed. Yes, true. But if it's an accuracy, no problem, as long as you don't criticize them. You give them encouragement. It's a positive feedback, right? Yes. Uh, the large large classes are difficult. I agree. Uh, there are some techniques you can use with large classes. Uh, you can find the, in some of our teachers' book. You have uh, 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 ideas on how to work with large classes. Okay. So mistakes are proof you are trying, but correcting mistakes are proof that you are growing. Right? Nice saying. Right? So you can have uh, basically two kinds. Uh, you can have more, but the, 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 the main ones are uh, praise and constructive criticism, cri criticism uh, or both. Which one are more uh, important? Praise, constructive criticism, or both? What do you think? Both, both. Yes, both are important, right? You should praise your students, but you should also give them constructive criticism. Okay? And by constructive, I mean that they should be able to learn something from it, not just criticize or and say something is wrong, right? So, 
So the five layers or the five elements of the safe speaking environment are time and space for speaking, engaging relevant topics, immersive speaking activities, positive peer interaction, and supportive feedback. If you can get that, I'm sure your students will be wonderful speakers, English speakers. Right. Let's see now five tips from five experts. First one, champion conversation in the classroom. I'm not going to read that, just read it, please. I'll give you some time to read it by Ben Goldstein. Ben Goldstein is one of Cambridge authors. Okay, one more. Thank you, Lucy. Yes, Lucy, I had to leave. Carrie Jones, her name is Carrie. This is spelled with C, but it's Carrie. Carrie Jones is also a Cambridge author. Speak through scaffolding, step by step, right? Scaffolding is learning step by step. You can read it, please. Right. One more tip. Now from Catherine Odell. Make speaking activities felt and not forced. One more, Leslie Hendra, get them absorbed in the task, not the talking. And the last one, Mark Ibotson, maintain a calm, relaxed, and judgment-free atmosphere. Okay, oh, you met Mark Ibotson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a really nice guy, yeah. So if you are, if you are interested in, in uh, learning more about this topic, uh, Cambridge has a website called cambridge.org slash safe speaking, where you will find blog articles, white papers and webinars about this, All right? We also have a Facebook page is uh, Facebook.com slash Cambridge UPELT. UP stands for University Press, right? Cambridge UPELT. Uh, if you want to follow the Twitter hashtag, is SpeakELT. Okay. If you are uh, interested in learning more about this, Cambridge has some materials that you can purchase from Gizal, right? One of these materials is called Teaching Speaking, a Holistic Approach by Christine Go and Anne Burns, right? The other one is called Practicing Spe uh, Teaching a Reflective Approach. This is a classical, a classic by Jack Richards, Jack Richards and Thomas Farrell. Okay, are oh, you reading the first one now? Excellent, teaching speaking is excellent. Practice teaching is a, a classic. Um, 
we have a new um, course book now called Evolve, which is uh, for young adults and adults, an American English course. And in this, uh, in this course, there's a lot of speaking, speaking matters, right? There's a lesson dedicated to speaking. So if you are interested, have a look at it. Okay. Uh, I have one message from Giselle. Uh, there will be, let me find here, there will be a session now at uh, five o'clock. Uh, this the title is gamification and ELT what why and how and uh, the speaker is Rafael Rodriguez okay so if you are interested in this topic I recommend you attend this webinar too all right okay thank you very much uh, I hope we can meet someday right when this quarantine is over I hope we can meet in person again. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, Nilda. Thank you, Patricia, Priscilla. Lots of lots of people. Maria de Socorro. Thank you. Marcia, Patricia, Arletti. Thank you. Thank you. Lisandra, Wellen. Yes. Thank you very much for participating. Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, from Uruguay. Thank you, Martin. Alex Solange, thank you. Bye bye. Alexandre Maria Carolina, thank you. Maranhão, oh, thank you, Miss Fred. A sample class of Evolve. Yes, please get in touch with our uh, <coughs> customer services. This is um, atendimento.br, atendimento.br, arroba cambridge.org. Okay, atendimento.br arroba cambridge.org. Thank you, thank you, Patricia. Andre, thank you. Yes, this lecture will be available to watch later. Yes, Giselle will make it available. Okay, I recommend this book, Evolve. Thank you, Sergio. Yes, it's there an online version of Evolve. There will be uh, ebooks coming out in uh, August. Okay. Right now we have uh, the the presentation plus, which is for teachers only, which is the online version. Thank you, Christian. Uh, Christiane. <laughs> Thank you, Christiane. You are amazing too. <laughs> it's a friend of mine, Viviani. Thank you. Jessica, thank you, Jessica. Beatriz, thank you. Thank you, Antonio Chile. From Belém, Antonio, thank you. Jo Joana Paula, thank you, Joana. Thank you from Manaus. Okay, Brenda, thank you very much. Hope to hear from you soon, Carmencita. Thank you, Carmencita. Curitiba, thank you. Practice teaching. Oh, you have the book autographed by the, the man, Jack Richards. Yeah, excellent, Martin. Yes. Is there a book that you can recommend me for conversation classes? Mm, we, we, we used to have a book called Let's Talk. But it's old now. For conversation, we don't have anything yet. We have uh, Evolve. Evolve has a lot of speaking. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. From Santa Maria, Adriana. Iguatu, Ceará, Isomar. Canoas, Rio Grande do Sul, Priscila. Thank you. Is Evolve interesting for executives? Yes, for adults. Yes, it's interesting. Thank you, Priscila. From Jaraguá do Sul, Maria do Socorro. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.